Okay, let's move on in our reading of uh, the Algemeine Begriff der Logik, the general concept of the logic. I already made a video about paragraph 1 up to 17, so we'll move on with paragraph 18. I'm going to try and be a little more concise and um, quick about it. Paragraph 18 has just this function. Uh, to answer a question I asked before, um, is it not true that the logic presupposes the concept of science? And now Hegel answers that question by arguing that the phenomenology of spirit actually is the deduction of the necessity uh, of science and that the logic presupposes the phenomenology of spirit inasmuch as it starts with some concept of science to guide the first stages of the logic. Uh, uh, well, first of all, to come to some kind of definition of what logic is and can be. So, in the Phenomenology of Spirit, I have presented consciousness as it progresses from the first immediate opposition of itself and the subject matter to absolute knowledge. Just a reminder, this first immediate opposition of itself and the subject matter, um, which is sensuous knowledge, um, this opposition of itself and the subject matter is the opposition of consciousness and the object as a this or that, uh, this now and uh, this uh, yesterday. Uh, so merely the pointing towards something like an object. And the expression, the logical expression for both the consciousness that itself is just like a this and the object that is like a this, the logical expression for both and for the relationship between both, and that is to say for the opposition of itself and the subject matter is being. Being is the logical category of sensuous perception. But this is actually more important. This path traverses all the forms of the relation of consciousness to the object. You can say that a little bit differently by saying that consciousness is divine, defined as the relationship between subject and object. Um, but here in the translation, the relation of consciousness to the object. Let me just check the German, German for a moment. Um, it does say Verhältnisses des Bewusstseins zum Objekt, so the relationship of consciousness to the object. Um, so <clears throat> it would be better terminologically to speak about the forms of consciousness than to speak about different consciousnesses. Okay, its result is the concept of science, das absolute Wissen, so that is knowledge that is totally self-related, that um, is knowledge of knowledge itself, including the object of knowledge. So we don't have to deal with this question, where does the concept of science come from? Where does this idea of necessary development come from? Um, the proof of all of this is the necessity of the manner it is produced by consciousness, as just mentioned. So the concept of science is deduced it's shown to be necessary, it's shown to be the ultimate result of um, just taking a look at how consciousness itself develops. Uh, totally different from all other kinds of external reflections on the notion of science or the history of science or what we think might uh, be meant with the idea of science. So we come to paragraph 19. The concept of pure science and its deduction is presupposed in the present work because the phenomenology of spirit is that deduction. Absolute knowledge is the truth of all the modes of consciousness because, as the course of the phenomenology brought out, it is only in absolute knowledge that the separation of the subject matter from the certainty of itself, so of the object and the subject, of the world, the reality, and the consciousness of it, that separation is completely overcome. Truth has become equal to certainty, and this certainty 
to truth. Yeah? So Gewissheit und Wahrheit, Gewissheit is certainty, uh, to be aware, to be um, aware of knowing something. And the truth, uh, to be aware that what you know is necessarily uh, uh, precisely how you know it. Yeah? So the difference between truth and certainty is uh, given by this idea of necessity. Truth is whatever is demonstrated and shown by necessity in a logical and systematic progression. Okay, that is kind of a definition of um, truth also. 20. Pure science presupposes the liberation from the opposition of consciousness. And so the opposition, opposition that is within consciousness that I, as a subject, know something other than myself, which is the object. Um, as science, truth is pure self-consciousness as it develops itself and has the shape of the self, so that that which exists in and for itself is the conscious concept, and the concept of such is that which exists in and for itself. So the concept is reality, and reality is already defined as conscious concept. A reality is only there where it is known, and reality and um, knowledge are completely coexistent, um, not separately existing, but coexistent. They are one and the same. How could it be otherwise? We cannot know something that we have no concept of. And the concept that we have would be purely formal and empty if there is no reality connected to it. 21. This objective thinking is thus the content of pure science. So pure science, pure logic, has objective thought as its content and not thinking as a psychological process or whatever. And then this wonderful um, sentence by Hegel. This realm, this realm of pure reason, is truth unveiled, truth as it is in and for itself. It can therefore be said that this content is the exposition of God as he is in his eternal essence before the creation of nature and of a finite spirit. So there is nothing finite about this truth. Whenever it is shown and demonstrated by necessity, that we uh, should express reality in uh, a particular manner, we are actually doing some exposition of the ultimate and absolute cause of that reality, or the ultimate or um, uh, essential reality itself. Then this historical reference to Anaxagoras, which shouldn't worry us too much, um, and then this idea that the notion that truth must be tangible, must be left behind. Okay, all of that is pretty clear. So let's move on to the final sentence of paragraph 23. The determinations of thought have objective value and concrete existence, which is actually already what he said before. Now we come to a couple of paragraphs that deal with Kantian philosophy, and I dealt with that in my previous video a lot. But I think it um, may be not that necessary to do that again now. So I'm going to skip 24, I'm going to skip 25. Uh, and then again in 26, he is repeating his demand of a reformation of logic. He is criticizing all kinds of psychological pedagogical. Pedag How does one say that in English? Pedagogical? Pedagogish. Uh, and even physiological material, um, that shouldn't be within the logic, and it isn't in Hegel's logic. Paragraph 28. Um, the reason why it is so spiritless, that is to say why formal logic on the whole is so spirit spiritless, has already been given above. Now, since in judgments and syllogisms, uh, um, if you don't know what a syllogism is, here's an example. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. So it's a um, series, a, a complex of judgments 
that one builds upon the other and some forms of that are valid and some are not and most of the time there is a quantitative approach um, by using uh, group theory um, to show that the syllogism is valid or not. They are founded upon, Hegel says, the quantitative aspect of the de determinations, uh, whether something is universal or particular or individual. Uh, so the universal is man, the particular here is mortality, then the particular should be used uh, uh, in the uh, uh, first premise. Um, every human being is mortal, uh, so mortality is the particular. And then the second one, Socrates, the individual, is um, this universal, he is a man, and so if he's part of uh, humanity and all of humanity is um, uh, has this uh, quality of mortality, then it follows quantitatively that Socrates is mortal as well. So he's quite right that everything rests on external differentiation, on mere, on mere comparison and becomes a completely analytical procedure and a calculus void of concept. Uh, analytical procedure because what is moving within the syllogism is actually just the principle of identity. Um, if A is B and C is AB, uh, is a particular B, then uh, of course A is C, or uh, rather B is an A. In this case, Socrates is, is mortal. So we don't need to deal with that. In the subjective logic, the third part of the logic, Hegel deals extensively with um, the syllogism, and that's a totally different kind of treatment. Quite interesting. Okay, 29, we'll skip that too. Again, he's talking about method in general. Now, this dialectic method in the Phenomenology of Spirit, I have presented an example of this dialectic method with respect to a concrete object, namely consciousness. Um, what he is uh, always ins insisting on is that scientific progress and the progress within dialectic method is only a progress um, by necessity, or resulting in something that is necess necessary, a necessary insight, necessary truth, um, if we come to the conclusion that we need dialectic method, that is to say that a negation is something positive. A negation is not the abstract negation, but it should be a determinate negation. That is something we will have to deal with again and again and again. That's where Hegel's insistence that we need determinate negation, or should look upon negation um, of a particular content, uh, as a determinate negation because the particularity within the negation is uh, leading up to the negation being about uh, a content as well. Uh, let's say the negation of being is not abstract negativity uh, but is um, ultimately um, nothingness or uh, the nothing but it's not absolute negativity. Cannot be like that. So, we come to paragraph 30. Uh, again, the assertion that it should be the content in itself, the dialectic which it possesses within itself, inasmuch as something is determinate, it has a dialectic within itself, because every kind of determination involves negation. And that is not something external to it but something within itself. And so every real concept, uh, let's take the concept of a cause, um, it has negativity within it because the cause is also the negation of its effect. And yet at the same time, they are dialectically um, both um, uh, united and separate. So by looking at the concept of cause like that and seeing how it relates to effect as something that it negates and posits at the same time, we can move the subject matter forward, or rather we can experience that the subject matter itself is moving forward. 
So the progression of this method should have this simple rhythm, he calls it here. It's the course of the fact itself. One remark about the translation, when you read the fact, you must understand that in Hegel's German, that, that is die Sache. Uh, and that is the thing on the, in discussion, that is the, the topic, that is the, um, the real subject matter of, uh, of our inquiry. Okay, 31. Uh, just a reminder that all the divisions and the headings of the book, uh, like the logic of being, or uh, the existence, or infinity, or being for itself, all of that is merely uh, of a historical value. And I will argue later on that uh, Hegel's choice for a particular name of a category within the logic has to be um, seen along these lines. So it's not really important whether we call existence, uh, existence, uh, Dasein, or being there, or uh, uh, how we will call that category. It's about the logical content of that category, and that's in that stage of the development. That's also just an historic idea. And that answers the question about the so-called fourth step in uh, Hegel's dialect, uh, dialectic, the, the presumed uh, necessity of the fourth step, where we have the thesis and the antithesis and then the synthesis, but then we move from the synthesis to a new thesis, and that requires positing a new name, a new category. That is not a real dialectic step, but it's something that strikes you just, um, let's say, on a literary level, and we are coming from being to nothing, uh, why do we wind up with the concept of etwas, uh, something out there, uh, or um, uh, rather uh, becoming in the, uh, in the logic of being? Huh? Why does he call that becoming? Well, the reason lies in the definition that he now gives to that category, but that's a historical matter. Um, if there is any other name in language that can be used for that, you might use that as well. You can call it simply being nothing, or nothing being, or uh, being to nothing. You can give it any name you like, as long as the logical structure of that concept, or uh, I w as I would call it, a category, is uh, clear to you. So that's just a matter of external reflection. Uh, behind all of that is also a very deep grasp of the philosophy of history, because according to Hegel, these categories uh, have also a place in the history of philosophy. And let's say becoming with uh, Heraclitus and being with Parmenides and nothing um, uh, maybe with the, uh, the skeptics, all of that is already uh, dealt with in the history of philosophy, and it's the background, the historic background to Hegel's logic, and, uh, by the way, also to his phenomenology of, uh, of spirit. Okay, now he explains all of that again in paragraph 32, and he um, makes it clear that formal logic in history, in, in, in uh, contemporary history to him, uh, has this external reflective side, which is um, doing what he is doing with the outward, the external names, the list of headings. Um, he's arguing that uh, in the logic that is just a, uh, a means to an end, but in those other formal logics, uh, that's actually the only thing they're doing. They're just giving a list of headings, they have this external way of ordering things. Uh, transitions are made by saying that now we are at chapter 2, or now we come to judgment and the like. And of course he wants nothing to do with that kind of external development within the logic. He wants to show the necessity, paragraph 33 says that, but then the necessity of the connectedness and the imminent emergence of distinctions, that is what he is after. The necessity of the connectedness and the imminent emergence of distinctions. That must be found in the treatment of the fact or die Sache, so the, the topic, um, for it falls, it falls within the concept's own progressive determination. So uh, look for that. Look for the imminent emergence of distinctions. 
uh, we have to take a look at the concept of nothing later on to find out whether the transition from being to nothing is an imminent emergence or not and whether or not there is a necessary connection between being and nothing. Okay, Kant again in paragraph 35, paragraph 36. The element of speculation is mentioned. It is in this dialectic as understood here, and hence in grasping opposites in their unity. The famous... Um, uh, unity of unity and difference. Uh, so opposites in their unity, being and nothing, have to be grasped, speculatively grasped, as belonging together. So we have to see them in their interconnectedness. The one is dependent upon the other. So the both of them together, in this case uh, of the logic of being, being becoming nothing, which is um, uh, disappearance, or destruction and uh, the negative uh, uh, becoming being transitioning to being which is coming into being that both of them together can be expressed as becoming in becoming we go from being to nothing and from nothing to being so being um, so becoming rather is <clears throat> the uh, um, the result of grasping the opposites being and nothing in their unity or to see see the positive and the negative um, the negative um, being nothing, the concept of nothing, that is, and there's something positive in there. Because, uh, well, for many reasons, we will see that when we come to the logic of being. That is the speculative moment. So the dialectic moment, corresponding more or less with reflective reasoning, that is, something is not its other. Something is opposite its other. That's the dialectic moment. But at the same time, there a relation is posited. If A is the negation of B and uh, B is the necessary negation of A, they also belong together. And the mutual exclusion of A and B is a sign of a new and higher unity. And that should be grasped. Now, that's very important. There is no formal way of reasoning or deducing that. You have to, in a way, get it. You have to grasp it. To grasp opposites in their unity and then explain. And in that explanation, that Darstellung, of course, only the necessity of it can show itself. But you have to start with what I sometimes have referred to as um, the metaphysical or dialectical in intuition. You can be dialectically deaf and unable to hear the unity in the opposites. Um, and that is um, uh, a variation of what one of my teachers once said, that some people are transcendentally blind, so they cannot see the conditions uh, that are necessary for something other to uh, exist. Um, but I think you can be dialectically deaf in the sense that you're unable to hear the unity of the opposite. Now we have to be trained by the logic, um, breaking ourselves free of the concrete representations of the senses and of ratiocination, and that is a formal reasoning, externally reasoning. So we must first practice abstract thinking. Abstract th thinking is concretely thinking just about this and not about something else. Um, abstract thinking means holding fast to concepts in their determinateness. Um, abstract here means to get rid of the concrete representations and the associations and the way language uh, works and has already a, a kind of a, a history with the meaning of a word. Now just to be totally focused and concentrated on the inner determinateness of a given um, concept, concept, and to learn to gain knowledge by means of them and not by something else that you refer it to or that you associate it with. Um, <clears throat> so abstract thinking here means to be free of these concrete representations of the senses uh, and of all kinds of reasoning in which a given concept is combined with 
all sorts of other thoughts and ideas. Um, okay, let's move on. He talks about the education and the relation of the individual to logic. I think I can skip that. And now we come to 38. I think I can skip that too. Uh, logic must be learned uh, in order to... Uh, uh, let me just read it. So logic must indeed at first be learned as something which one may well understand and penetrate into, but in which at the beginning one misses the scope, depth and broader significance. It looks like toying around with um, abstract concepts that have no significance whatsoever. However, the logic as the basis of all other philosophical sciences proves itself to be significant um, when we go beyond it to the sphere of objective spirit, for instance, and the absolute spirit, history, art, religion, all of that. Okay. 39. Now, although this power of logic is not consciously present to spirit at the beginning of its study, such a study will nevertheless impart to it the inward power which will lead it to the truth. The system of logic is the realm of shadows, the world of simple essentialities, freed of all sensuous concre concretion. To study this science, to dwell and to labor in this realm of shadows, is the absolute culture and discipline of consciousness. That is how vital the logic is, that is how important it is to study the logic, which at the same time, of course, is the basic system of metaphysics. To get rid of the intuitions and the goals of the senses, to get rid of all these representations, is the first step um, to uh, true philosophy. Okay, I will leave it at that. I will deal in the next video with the general division of the logic, just a couple of paragraphs. But we need to move on, and that's why I decided to go a bit quicker through these uh, paragraphs than, uh, than before. Um, if you're part of the... Um, Science of Logic uh, group on Facebook, then you will know why we need to have a, a, a higher pace because we really want to uh, study all three volumes of the logic um, in a finite time. We're not going to do this uh, for the next 25 years or so. So we need to read every week and study every week. So something like 40 uh, pages in order to uh, be able to do so. So necessarily I have to um, keep these videos uh, a bit on the surface just to pick out a few, a few uh, important points to comment uh, upon. Okay, thanks for listening and uh, see you next time.